In this video, we're going to go over some assembly layout tricks, how you would start a clean sheet aircraft so that the fuselage and, and rest of the airplane can contain your payload elements uh, very nicely. You'll have a very good understanding of how the payload goes into the airplane. So we'll go through typical procedures and orders and suggested process for drawing and starting an airplane. And that all begins with payload. So let's actually start by creating a new file, just a simple part. And uh, for this, I'll just use a, a payload that came from DBF uh, a couple years back. It was a simple uh, set of bouncy balls for um, the people, the passengers of a payload. I think the bouncy balls, they varied in size that year. Let's just keep things a bit easier, make them one inch in diameter. Uh, to do a revolution, I'll just throw a center line on this thing real quick. I think it has to also be closed. I don't want it to be double-sided. So I'll put a solid line up here in the middle and then blank things out with trim entities. There we go. Half of a sphere. Exit that sketch. Features revolve. That one, sphere. Okay. Thanks. And I'll save this as, hopefully under the aerospace lessons. Yep, passenger. All right. So there's our passenger that is uh, very, very round. Okay, the other thing they had to carry that year was, uh, if I can remember right, some sort of, yeah, it was a payload block. It was like a specified size. I think all the edges had to add up to nine inches or something like that. So let's, oop, not dimensions, sketch, uh, right plane. I think if I remember right from what they did, it was two inches by five by two, something like that. But that'll be good enough for our packaging. We'll just do that this time. So I will save that on the side. Do a little, oof, I hate that background. I, wish, I should probably go in and make a custom template. So I never have to click that again. Uh, two inches wide. Okay, so that was, I think that was about right. That was the payload they ended up going with at the competition. Put that inside their airplane so we can uh, save this as cargo payload. Now, so those are the elements that were designed. I mean, of course, in a real aircraft design, you'd have an actual person model. You'd have this chair model. You'd have perhaps a, a munition if it's a military vehicle or, uh, you know, whatever other payloads you're carrying. Maybe it's a medical supply, so it'd be a blood bag, kind of like the zipline company. Anyway, neat stuff going on. The real point of this video is to show you now that we have our payloads made. We'll go into an assembly and start laying these out. Uh, at first, oh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, can we open up both of them. Should be able to... Yeah, there's passenger, there's the cargo. I don't really want either one to be fixed. So, okay, we'll go to plain white background. By default, the first thing you add, I think, becomes fixed in space in the assembly. So actually, I'll right-click on it and say float. Notice that now I can move it around and I can move the other around freely, whereas if it's back to fixed, then that becomes kind of the reference point and becomes, well, as you, as you think, fixed in place in the assembly. But okay, this is where a good discussion of origins in the assembly would would make sense it, it it makes sense from an aerospace perspective to have the nose of the vehicle as the origin of your aircraft that's fairly common convention the only downside could possibly be if you ever had to extend the nose uh, you'd end up with negative station lines being like negative distances to the front of your vehicle it's not the end of the world though it does just tell anybody looking at your cat model that uh, you had to change it and for some reason that's that's a negative thing uh because there'll be infinite changes. Anybody who says they didn't change their airplanes probably lying or a really bad engineer. So let's just, instead of the origin, let's go ahead and put these payloads back a little bit and, and start doing some notional layout. Inside of each element here, we can do some constraints of the planes. And I really start doing a lot of my mating constraints for assemblies based on planes and, and points inside of parts instead of actual surfaces on them. Because that lets you change the shape of a part while the position stays more or less correct. So if I wanted all these passengers just on a level field with the rest of the airplane, where this assembly level, notice assembly level, front, top, and right-hand planes will always stay, those will be relevant to the outer mold line of the airplane, right? So we're gonna draw the fuselage, we're gonna draw the wings, and that'll be the body frame of the aircraft. Whereas with this passenger, you know, it doesn't really matter where the front, top, and right planes are, though in this case, it's conveniently uh, right across the middle of the vehicle. So, okay, that makes sense that now it's constrained vertically. We can still put the passenger anywhere in the vehicle we want. For the payload, hmm, what do I want to do here? So, I'll collapse the passenger file, expand the payload. I don't know. Yeah, so the top plane, we'll make that to the top plane of the overall aircraft. Let's flip it over so we can actually flip that mate alignment. 
Okay, we're going to have to obviously add something else in here. So the, I guess either one of these works. The front plane of the payload will actually be the, oh, this is interesting. So now we start managing direction. So the right plane of the aircraft. So now, since they're titled, the front perspective, the top perspective, and then the right perspective. I want to stay with that, though if you notice real quick, if, and if SolidWorks hasn't changed it on me, the front plane does not match the coordinate system, if you look down here with the triad, of our aerospace units. So you can either choose these names, you, you can potentially rename them if you want, I guess, just right click, maybe, maybe you can't rename those, that'd be interesting. Surely you can, right click, rename, rename. Right. Yeah, rename tree items. So, so you could change that to match aerospace convention. So that way your X would be forward, Y would be out the right-hand side, and Z would be down, I guess. Yeah, that would be it. So you could make it all line up. Um, not going to do that right now. Just going to go with the descriptions of front, top, and right. Because that will also match some of these drop-down menu uh, conventions here that are in the orientation drop-down menu of SolidWorks. So anyway, just know that uh, you could make your own coordinate system, and you will be making that later if you do CAD or CAM uh, processes on your devices. So back to the major point, we've got these devices set up with respect to the origin. I'm going to go to the top-down view, so we can actually now move the passenger around pretty easily. Payload same way. Okay, it's constrained on center line, which is probably good for most payloads. Um, and I think in their competition year, they actually had the payload at the same level of the passengers just sitting behind it. So let's go ahead and edit the mate. So it'll be back here. So view mates for that one. Coincident. Nope. Oh, the vertical ones here. Yeah, let's change that. So right click on it, edit. Instead of being a coincident constraint, let's do a dimensional constraint. If it's two inches tall, one inch should make it halfway. And all right, we're good. So now the payload is directly behind the passenger. Well, we want passengers as plural, right? So let's do a linear component pattern and actually set this up. Direction 1, referencing this back to directions. So normal directions of planes can be used as vectors. So direction 2 of the overall assembly. Let's do this side to side. Yep, so let's do, I don't know, what would this be, four rows and two columns, components to pattern, that little sphere. Yeah, so that makes it relatively nice. Instead of having to import in place and import in place and import in place, you can now adjust you know, the number of passengers contained inside of your aircraft very easily. You'll be able to go back and modify this pattern to, uh, to make it whatever you want. Curiously, unfortunately, this competition year uh, ended up that uh, zero passengers was optimal and only one passenger was required by the rules, so every competitive aircraft that flew in the competition only used one. Uh, that was a, a little bit of a singularity the the conference or the competition designers missed on that one. But anyway, let's uh, let's go ahead and place these roughly. Now, you see me doing a lot of this visually, just dragging and dropping. It's not exactly high precision work, uh, but for now, that's all I want to do. Let's see how. Where am I at with respect to the origin? That oops, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're ahead of the front of the airplane. So let's scoot this back, and now we really start the real point of doing starting with payloads first because this allows you to draw the airplane around whatever it is you have to contain. You could even go as far as to place a notional battery, place a notional receiver. In fact, you really should. Once you have an idea of how big or what kind of components, what kind of systems your vehicle should be containing. Um, so these are the actual payloads by the competition, but you should add whatever else makes sense. So that way you're not looking for space later. You have designed in space for every single component. So the origin's out here well in front. We should be good to go. So what I'd like to do at this point, even before I start drawing a legitimate you know, loft, is to just make a simple, easy sketch in the assembly level. Notice I'm actually doing the top plane of the assembly. The sketch is going into the assembly. It's useless for making parts, but it's really, really, really nice to just kind of get an idea of what your plane can look like. So then you go around the side, and then come back here for a tail. Obviously, that will change this around with the uh, spline handles a little bit. Let's go straight horizontal. Yeah, it could be worse. Do a little bit more shaping. Looks like a baseball bat of sorts. Yeah, the nose needs to be much more slender. Decrease that tension. 
All right. Whoa. Uh, yeah. That. <laughs> hmm. Odd. Yeah. So you'll be you'll find that working with aerospace, trying to get nice curvy bodies and constructions, you'll spend a lot of time with spline handles, and they're not always the most well-behaved things, but it should work. All right. So that's fine. Just to make things simple, we will go ahead and mirror this across in the sketch domain, which will require a center line. Okay. Mirror entities. That spline mirroring about the middle. I, I would never, ever recommend trying to draw another e spline exactly the same way. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Uh, notice now the nice thing is if you adjust one of these, <laughs> the other one moves with it. it. That would look terrible, but... It's possible. There's also some benefits to not over constraining these. Don't make 12 control points. Notice this is a start and end and two interior control points. So there's not really a whole lot defining shape. But that keeps everything nice and smooth and and uh, with low, uh, usually low magnitude curvatures. All right, so let's escape. That'd be kind of your top down perspective. And then from the side, we would do the same thing just to give it kind of an idea. And this is all just some initial layout work. You should have drawn, and I assume by watching this video, you have already drawn your uh, your concept sketch. So you should know what the airplane is roughly going to look like before you go even to this stage. So on the right plane, let's do another little quick sketch, see what's going on. This is a point where you might want to have a different top to the aircraft than bottom. Uh, oftentimes that's born out of requirements that you're able to rotate. You know, there's that pesky thing on the back of your airplane called a tail that you don't want to scrape off on the runway as you're taking off. So uh, yeah, usually allowing for that is good. Again, uh, to keep the stagnation point right to the nose, uh, let's go ahead and make this vertical. Interesting enough, having a pointed body subsonically is, is not really a drag advantage. Uh, in fact, that's, that's way up there, isn't it? Um, so this is where, ideally, you'd probably place a receiver, you'd place your battery up here in front, and you would just model that like any other payload that we've put in this, in this system. Uh, a more complete tutorial would include that, but this is really more based on skills than, than making a perfect airplane. I just want to demonstrate what is possible, and you can add in all the details later once you do the full design. Okay, any other... Yeah, maybe we'll give some more payload room. Give it a... what you might call a, a, a deep chin. And then uh, this might come to some sort of a boat tail, so instead of a point in the back, it'll come to a uh, kind of a vertical line. It'll still be uh, zero thickness at the back. But a straight vertical tail instead of a uh, instead of a singular point. Okay, so this gives it some depth. You have some nice payload capability there in the bottom, whether that's for batteries, a receiver, or just structure, or a wing passer, whatever you need. Uh, the only thing that's certain about these lines is that they're going to change throughout the uh, design. So we'll just say okay. Now you have a rough picture. Oops, they're different lengths. Should line those up. Okay, we can do that. Um, sketch two. This line should be at that, this point. Okay, let's angle it a bit. That point, all right. This should be coincident. Okay, so that's nice. You can constrain one sketch to another. Just know if you deleted it, you've now created an automatic dependency between the two. You could, at this point, if you so wanted to, uh, and for various reasons, I don't recommend this. Can I even do it in the assembly level? Probably not. Yeah. Good. It won't even let me. That's nice. You could start extruding surfaces and just do a simple intersection between these two. That would produce some sort of a prismatic uh, aircraft body. And it would work. It would be simple to build. Uh, it could potentially even be fairly lightweight, but uh, it would not be the smoothest, nicest body that could be created for an aerospace vehicle. So that's, that's the skill development that we want to accomplish here. But overall, this is kind of the layout and design that allows you to very easily just place different components. Ideally here, you would also continue. Let's do this in the top view. You'd go back in and say, well, if I need a wing area of, I would encourage you to use the center rectangle option for this. Ooh, obviously in the wrong place right now. And you just scoot farther back. The swing's a bit large, but that makes it very easy and very nice to keep things moving symmetrically. Let's say we had a notional conceptual cord of six inches notional conceptual span of 28. So that shows you where the wing could be laid out. Do the same thing with the tail. 
fact, I'll give it a little bit more style with the tail. Just making this up as I go. That looks nice. Let's mirror it across the middle. Oops. Click the wrong thing at the wrong time. This line, this line, this line. Okay. And for the conceptual type sketch where you're just laying things out and looking at sizes, getting areas, etc. I mean, this is plenty good enough. Um, I wouldn't even worry about doing the intersections of these splines. I, I really wouldn't. Uh, because that would break some of your control points. So this really quickly starts to give you a picture of what your plane might look like, what the size could be. And there's some other elements that I would really encourage you to do on the side view as well to start adding in things like uh, main gear, nose gear, uh, a ground contact angle, which let's let's do that. Um, let's put a little wheel down here. If we expect to have, what you might call it, one inch wheels. And we could measure now a CG distance back from the nose, which that line's going to be hard to grab again. And this is where some of your initial weight and balance sheets, let's let's make up a number and say that that was telling me the CG is going to be 8 inches back from the nose at, assumedly, the center line or very close to center line height. We start laying out a several geometric requirements based on recommendations from Raymer's textbook and other just general aircraft uh, references. But now I want to set an angle between the center of gravity and this uh, tilt back angle. I think typically uh, 15 degrees is adequate and you would want the contact point of your wheel, which wouldn't necessarily, well, yeah, we'll make the center line actually. That would work out because as the airplane rotates, the center line moves directly above the contact point. Let's make that coincident with that back angle. So this means that your main wheels when the airplane's sitting on the ground will always be behind no matter what height you need off the ground that would be absurdly tall this is absurdly short however your main wheels would always be behind the center of gravity in fact if we can go ahead and draw a nose wheel in here its placement is a little bit less consequential as long as you keep the weight on the nose wheel small that's another common dbf mistake that people start putting half their vehicle's weight on the nose and that's an issue Let's go ahead and just you know assume that's going to have to be horizontal to the main gear. So that constraint now means that it can move anywhere it wants as long as it's you know sitting level with the mains. In fact, uh, you probably wouldn't want to put it you know in the path of the propeller or something. But anyway, I digress. This means that your CG, which we suppose is at eight inches right now, is always going to be in front of your mains and behind your nose wheel. That means the plane shouldn't tip back as it sits on the ground. That'd be bad if you set it on the runway and it just tips back onto its tail. Uh, passengers probably would want, wouldn't want to board your airplane if it did that. This also let, allows you to do something else. Your aerodynamics team, or your aerodynamicist lead, or however you get the information, should be able to tell you exactly what rotation angle is required at takeoff. Or really, what's even more useful is what is your rotation angle for CL max? And let's suppose that for several airplanes might be 12 degrees. Now keep in mind this needs to take into account incidents of the wing, any sort of rotation in the wing, twist in the wing, whatever other kind of things you might be doing, camber, etc. And so if 12 degrees was a magic number, uh, this might let us start modifying the fuselage so, th so that all the pilot would have to do is pull back really hard on the stick and in this UAV type scenario, smack the tail on the ground and they're automatically at CL max. Hopefully that doesn't slow them down too much. But this also shows you that if you designed a tail that exists in this region, uh, that's that's going to be a problem. It makes sure that your tail is completely out of that rotation angle and also gives you some other uh, knowledge about what happens as you make this higher and lower to the ground. Potentially you could have some very, very, very short gear. In fact, I've always kind of wanted to lay out a plane like this. Uh, like sailplanes, for example, their their main wheel is usually halfway embedded into the okay that twelve's in the way halfway embedded into the fuselage. Da, 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 there we go. Move this point up, make it look a bit, do a little bit of shape work now. It's not horrible. Okay, so that payload's getting pretty close to the bottom. That would be concerning. I think once you take into account skin thickness and some other things, that'd be a bit too close. So this is where the trade-offs between ground clearance, uh, landing gear height, which also dictates landing gear weight, uh, things really start to add up and cause issues. In fact, 
in some ways, it might almost be beneficial if our CG was farther aft at the design point, because now look what that does. It gives us plenty more room to add some more volume around our payload compartment, uh, give it some more depth. In fact, you can now even get that, that wheel even shorter. You're getting close to being able to embed a wheel inside this vehicle, which would be pretty neat. So anyway, you can see the trade-offs you make. Your design will be your own. You can make the airplane as you want. You just do have to meet these requirements. You don't want to smack the tail on takeoff. I should probably have some sort of vertical tail uh, described here at least. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly sized at this point because I assume that at some point during the design process you'll go through horizontal and vertical tail sizing, which that one looks massively way too big. Okay, let's fix it. Maybe that's better. Sure. Okay, that's main wheel, nose wheel, payload, uh, center of gravity uh, distance. Uh, note that you could also have a substantially, you know, off-center line vertical, at least, center of gravity as well. Maybe all your weight's low in the airplane, maybe uh, whatever. Uh, that could be used to your advantage with these geometric constraints, but this is something that can be very simple if you just set up those relationships inside SolidWorks so that they're automatically maintained. A note on equations at this stage, though. You could start making equations for everything, uh, making, you know, doing automatic calculations of vertical tail volume, horizontal tail volume. You can set all that up in SolidWorks, and it will work. It can work. But ask yourself if that's really the shortest path towards a successfully flying airplane. It, it, it probably is not. Uh, SolidWorks is used it mostly as a geometric tool. Uh, use your computational tools for those numbers uh, outside. So... Actually, at this stage, for laying out payloads, for laying out other internal elements, of which you really, really, really should add receiver and maybe even some servos and show where your systems are going to go inside the airplane, just doing this wireframe type mock-up at the beginning will save you so much work later on when you actually go to making 3D models of the fuselage and other elements.